Okay, so I think we'll make a start. Um, looks like we've got uh, plenty of uh, participants on. So uh, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to the next in our series of uh, BCFA business webinars, Surviving COVID-19. Um, the, the webinars were originally conceived for, I guess, a point like now, uh, where we were starting to think about what comes beyond the lockdown as we look to uh, to move forward, hopefully with further announcements this weekend. Um, for those of you that have not been able to join a webinar before, my name is Mark Sprague. I'm the managing director of a company called Where Now Consulting. Um, we are management consultants that specialize in helping companies to uh, grow, to compete, and to improve profitability. And we've been working really throughout the uh, the recent weeks, really helping people uh, think about their uh, funding, helping them with loans, helping them with uh, reorganizing their businesses, and a lot of work around actually uh, positioning new uh, approaches to the market as uh, sales channels are a little bit disrupted at the moment. We're delighted to be supporting uh, the BCFA and its members in, uh, in these webinars, which we hope you'll find uh, informative. I'm joined today uh, by, as always, by Jeremy uh, from the BCFA um, and also by uh, Caroline Donaldson uh, from a company called Kinesis uh, that is a uh, specialist in organisational development. And last but not least, by Laura McKnight, uh, who is an associate director of uh, McDonald Henderson Solicitors and is a specialist in employment law and also data protection and D GDPR. This, uh, this webinar is going to really focus on uh, the human resource impact as we start to move beyond uh, the, uh, the lockdown. And, and it was actually uh, a topic that was raised with a couple of questions uh, from BCFA members from previous webinars, actually one during the webinar and one as a follow-up, um, relating to two, uh, two areas actually, one around uh, the restart and the obligations on employers and how people would think about that, and also about uh, redundancies. Uh, so during the course of this um, webinar we will uh, directly address both of those questions that were raised um, but if people have other questions that they would uh, like to ask any of the panel during the webinar please feel free to do so there is a Q&A function at uh, either the bottom or the top of your screen I'm told it's in different places on different versions of Zoom so either the bottom or the top of the screen uh, just click on Q&A type your question in um, and we will, during the course of the webinar, if we can answer it, if we run out of time or if there is a specific technical uh, question that we need to, uh, to revert to one of our teams for, uh, we'll actually answer um, to all of the, uh, the attendees after the, uh, after the webinar. If you would like to raise a question anonymously, you can do so if you don't want to, us to see who's raised the question. Um, as you type your question in, you'll see there is a, a, a box to tick. If you tick that, then the question will come through in an anonymous fashion. So um, before we move on to the main part of the webinar today, um, as always, I'd like to ask um, Jeremy from the BCFA to give us a short update on what the BCFA is really up to at the moment uh, on behalf of its members, um, what, uh, what you're hearing, Jeremy, in the marketplace, and of course, uh, whether there's been any further feedback from the, um, from the uh, discussions you were having with the government. So on that note, Jeremy, I'll, I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Mark. I just noticed that we've, uh, we have on, our, on the slide, it was the wrong slide, just in case anybody's confused by that. It was the financial planning one, but uh, I'm sure we can change that. Um, for those of you who listened last week, I had to rush off halfway through to go and join in um, the Furniture and Furnishings All Party Parliamentary Group inquiry uh, into the impact of COVID on our industry. And um, about half of the uh, um, manufacturers being interviewed by the MPs were BCFA members. That included Oster Carpets, uh, Morgan Furniture, Boss, Hypnost, um, a number of others. And that inquiry was looking at the impact, um, how effective the support had been, and, uh, and what further support the sector needs. And we uh, obviously went through some of the asks that we've been going for, like uh, extended um, business rates holiday. Um, 
that has been drafted up, those findings for that inquiry have been drafted up. I've seen the first draft and that should be out this afternoon and being sent to the Treasury and uh, the Chancellor and the Prime Minister. Um, and I'll be able to circulate that to BCFA members next week and we'll probably publish it on the BCFA website. Uh, it, was, it, was a, 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 it was a fascinating discussion, not just from BCFA members, but also from those manufacturers uh, operating in the, in the consumer field as well. Um, and one of the key things that came out of that discussion was the amount of preparation that all of them had done for reopening. Um, and that uh, has been done somewhat in using common sense and would have, because the guidance from government has not been great. But what we've been working on this week is providing feedback to Bayes on their seven drafts, um, working safety guidelines that are going to be, I assume, published next week. Um, and uh, well, I have asked, I've invited some of the BCO members to give feedback and actually the documents are uh, largely common sense. They're, they're pretty solid. Um, there are some gaps. Um, and uh, the key things on that is all about management of risk. And each document starts off with a risk assessment. And for, many, for all of us, it's going to be about managing risk, which really feeds into the conversation today, I hope, anyway. Um, so that's what we're, we're doing. And again, um, I will, we will... Um, as soon as those documents, or at least I, I can have a draft that we can publicise, we'll circulate those. So uh, over back to you, Mark, and um, catch you later. Thanks, Jimmy. Good. So uh, as, as always, you know, outside of that update, if any members have got any questions or, or concerns uh, that they think are pertinent to uh, Jeremy and the team, then please do reach out separately to the team. Uh, it really helps the BCFA understand exactly what uh, support they can provide uh, and uh, uh, and helps also uh, with future webinars like this one. So if there's a specific topic that uh, that any of the members would like to uh, to have us cover, then again, please let us know and we will uh, we will build that in. Um, on, on behalf of the BCFA, um, we we completed a survey which we closed last week. Um, which first of all, I'd like to thank all of the members for, or many of the members for participating in. It was a very very good response rate. Uh, we closed the survey off last uh, last uh, Friday. Uh, we're aiming to uh, to have the the final document actually ready for um, publishing this evening. And uh, Jeremy, I presume you'll put that out uh, directly to the members, or will that go out via the the web? Website. It, uh, it'll go out on Monday with our um, Monday um, update. Okay, great. So thanks very much for everybody that, that participated in into that. I think it's it's very helpful to really get an understanding and certainly helps uh, Jeremy and the team in their discussions with the government. Uh, but it is a snapshot in time. So we will be repeating that survey again at the end of July, three months time, um, to, uh, to really see how things are progressing. And if we need to, we'll do it again uh, three months after that. So we get a view as, as to how the, uh, the, the membership is being impacted by uh, the pandemic. Um, so I think it's probably a good point for us to uh, turn our attention now to the human impact and the HR impact of, uh, of, of moving beyond the lockdown. It's clear, um, as Jeremy said, that we're in a world where business is starting to uh, to think about how it gets back to work. Many, many companies are, have been doing that for the last 10 days, really, as we started to sort of step out of April into May. And it's also clear from the government, the press, uh, but also the fact there are documents like the, the seven, do seven steps document that you're receiving uh, now, Jeremy, that, that we are moving into a world where we're, we're coming back to some sort of new norm. Um, and, and that really sort of drives then a series of discussions around uh, what we should be doing from the, the HR and human impact all the way from risk assessments of you know how we do the PPE to uh, to how we get people to safely to work to um, actually how we physically get our production uh, level at the right uh, level. So there's really a wide variety of topics we could cover in this webinar. Um, uh, as we start to think about preparing for work, um, you know, what should or could business leaders be thinking about as they as they are as they move forward? Are there any new responsibilities or obligations that are placed on on directors or, or leaders as, uh, as as we move into this time? How do, how do we balance the different work patterns? You know, we all know that some of us are going to be continuing to work from home. Some may continue on furlough. Some may be 
in working in the office or on the shop floor uh, in the factory uh, and how do we balance that different uh, those different work patterns both from a leadership and management point of view uh, but also uh, re reflecting sort of mental health and, uh, and and well-being in in the workplace and elsewhere uh, and of course, we've got the the overriding concern of um, our employees and uh, and uh, you know on interpersonal self uh, uh, safety and health and those of of their families uh, as they start to think about that balanced with the economic concerns that are un undoubtedly around there at the moment. So there's a whole um, sort of raft of things we could talk about. Uh, I'm going to. Um, probably start with Caroline and, 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 and let you sort of lead on with the, the sort of areas that you're seeing Caroline as, as sort of key concerns at the moment uh, or key areas that people should be thinking about and then we'll, we'll revolve around from there to, uh, to Laura and by myself. So uh, Caroline, welcome to, the, welcome to the webinar. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Mark. And you know, it's exactly what clients are saying right now. Um, they are, uh, they've got, well, I wouldn't say they've got over, but they've got used to working from home, the new way, and they are managing that okay. And they are now, their heads are um, attending to what, how do we come out? How do we, how do we move on? And in fact, I was with a client yesterday and he's still doing his weekly chats with his people. That's really, really important. And, and, and I would suggest if anybody's not doing that, that they definitely need to. Um, and it's not just the business as usual weekly chat. It's the human kind of weekly chat. So they have bacon butty Friday morning. So I thought that was quite a nice idea. <laughs> um, and then, um, and I think that he, consulting the people because he's going now to his own team and saying um what's working for you you know uh, what, where is it not working as well because he himself as the leader of this business he's the md he's actually come to a bit of a brick wall himself he's finding so um i think realizing that some days you're just not as motivated when you work from home as you are when you're going into office there's a pace about being in the office that just sort of carries you with it sometimes you know we all have days where we maybe don't want to go there but if, but you go there and it's busy whereas when you're on your own you've got to make your own busyness and um for some businesses where like his his, his business is 50 percent down and i don't know how many businesses are um, experiencing that or even worse i know some businesses that are even busier because they're piling on more work while they're at home so we do need to get a, a um a good feeling of well how is that impacting on our on our staff on our employees some are working far too long days because they've got the kids there as well and they can't operate normally with the children of course um, and others just can't switch off you know they find it really hard to switch off because they're working from home so i think in the thinking about going back um how can the business survive and i know we'll get our um hopefully some clarity from government on Sunday, I think, but, but I know businesses are now talking about that. I had a call this morning with somebody and she's saying, we're not sure how we're going to manage the work with these split shifts and how would it work? So again, going to, in fact, she's, she's put together a, a survey and she's going to be asking the question, what would work? And would be one day working in the, in, in the, in the office or in their places of work a week, be a start and in what way would that help and and then of course with the social distancing how do you use the space this is what my guy yesterday was saying he said we've not got a huge office <laughs> you've got office space and of course this is your world um office space but but how we use that space we couldn't have everybody there anyway at the same time so it, it's a really hard one to judge because how will you know it's okay to go in if i personally was in that office i'd be thinking well how safe is it for me <laughs> you know? and I think oh, we've got testing so I think some of it I think some of it will be around if we can have testing available how do we get to work do we go on a train do we go on a, a bus or do we do we you know take our car all that will have an impact on how quickly people can go back to work and I think the other bit is are willing to go back to work so I think there's a there's going to be a bit of a, a an interesting shift um going forward mm -hmm. I think Caroline, you know, as you sort of looking at this with 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 your sort of, I guess the more coaching side of, of yeah. you, you know, one of the things that's always there when people have had extended periods off work or for whatever reason is there is an anxiety. Yeah. For going back. Yeah. Uh, so yes, there'll be an excitement to going back, but I guess there'll also be an anxiety for many yeah. people that have been yeah. 
well, out of the workplace for, for a long time. You know, again, that's really all around consulting and, and discussion. Yeah, that's it quite is. It's your entire team. Normally it's one person or yeah. two. Yeah. yeah, it is the entire team. You're absolutely right. And I think the, the lady I was speaking to this morning, she said how we approached the pandemic at the very beginning was quite different to how we're approaching the planning to go back. She said it was absolute, it was like the common purpose was, and the very focused was, get out, <laughs> everybody out, everybody at home, find ways of working from home and make that work. So that was the focus. And she said, and you know, it was quite relatively easy, as in straightforward. I don't mean easy, but straightforward. Whereas I think um, the going back is where it, it's much more difficult and you've got to take all that into consideration. So yeah, I think the conversations will still have to be done like this. You know, like let's have a, you can do a poll. You can do, you can do polling on Zoom, by the way. You can, you can do a poll, you can do surveys. You can also have chats with people about how are they feeling. Mm -hmm. And we need to address it and not be skirting around it. But I also know that until we know what the guidance is, we're not going to be able to have a conversation about what's what about the criteria for the guidance. Mm -hmm. So we actually need that guidance to be able to say, right, well, this is what the guidance is. How are we going to implement that? Mm -hmm. right. yeah. mm. Laura, any thoughts from your side? Um I would just reiterate really that the key to all of this will be speaking to employees. And I think what I'm finding with clients is that actually your employees are the ones that will come up with some of the best ideas. And it will give you a sense as well about, you know, almost to gauge their reaction to coming back what they want to see in place, albeit yes, we'll have to do it with the government's guidance at the back of our heads. But um, what, how they're feeling, they, you'll be able to gauge their anxieties and hopefully then the, the ideas and the measures that you then need to put in place will hopefully come to quite easily. Um, I always say that you know, employees are the key to all this and yeah, as soon as you get, get them popping and you'll know what is worrying them the most, whether it be something stupid like, you know, will we be able to share the kettle for our tea breaks? You know, all these, all these things that are actually quite important to day to day working in an office, factory, yard, whatever. And um, things like that. If you know, as soon as you kind of realise what what is worrying them, it might be a little bit more easier to make sure that you're putting everything in place correctly. And Laura, that there's been, you know. A, 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 I think quite a bit of concern around the, the sort of obligations on business uh, as we come back in. So there is the risk assessment um, piece that sort of, you know, covers uh, one of those, uh, uh, you know, um, you know, uh, we've got a question coming in pretty much along those, those lines. So, you know, uh, and I'll, I'll come on to it because it's actually a very valid question and and, uh, and 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 is right on the back of this. So you know, if we're if we're looking at, at at the employer's responsibilities, you know, we are in an area of we're going to get guidance next week, but that guidance will be guidance, and then we'll, as business people, have to implement that guidance. And I guess there is that concern um, that that if things don't necessarily work out that there may be liabilities down the track uh, we just had a question in uh, you know which is which is really a link to that which is about how how do we work where people don't feel safe about coming into work and they don't want to risk contamination and 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 therefore you know what happens if they refuse to come back into work and it's a key member of your team yeah, and I think it is going to be a huge, huge concern. And I think it will happen. People will say that they are worried about, about, about coming back. An employer's obligation is to listen to those concerns and then attempt to put certain measures in place. And again, it'd be asking the question, what is it that you're actually finding unsafe here? What can we do to try and fix that? Um, and if there is a, a, you know, a full refusal to come to work, there's, there's obviously options that you can then that men take for those employees but I think the, the, the key will be to see what is it what actually is it that you are concerned about and what can we do yeah. um, which will hopefully help I guess it's difficult though to take any direct actions if, if people aren't coming back even though you've you've addressed the concerns there's even if they because they still feel 
nervous, there's still that challenge, isn't there, around, uh, you know, there is the furlough scheme. So what happens to the, uh, you know, what happens to the, the people if they, if they refuse to come in, can they remain furloughed or should you start be taking alternative steps you know that that's that's quite a it's quite a difficult balance really isn't it when on one hand the government said go home <laughs> uh, you know be furloughed and then you mm. want them to come back in and they don't want to come back in for, for probably very good reasons in many cases because they feel frightened about the, the world out there mm. and i think it's actually going to be a little bit more difficult whilst we still have the furlough scheme and um, because the argument from the employee's point of view will be well just keep me on furlough um, but remember, that's a business decision. If you, if you want to cease using the, the potent job retention scheme, you're, you're in your right to cease using it um, and keep it from there. Um, I think the best thing you can do, best practice, is to give options if somebody is saying, I want to continue being on furlough, I don't want to be in at work. And as many options you can give them as possible so that you're not, the employer's not being the unreasonable one. And this is when these ideas like staggered shifts, staggered working times, you know, to avoid sort of public transport, job shares, and um, all these ideas to try and get people into work safely. Um, and the more options you give to an employee and they're still refusing, then unfortunately it's the employee that seems to be the unreasonable one there. Mm -hmm. And that's when you can start maybe perhaps with more drastic drastic action in terms of them um but yeah trying to think of all options is, is the way to go there that if any particular employee is refusing hmm. yeah so, so we've had a a, a question I, I i i i'm not sure it's one that will will necessarily be able to answer until we get to sunday but um you know we've got a question that so we may get clarity about face masks and if everyone uh, must have one um uh, assuming we can get hold of the masks you, you know then that's one which probably comes out of the way but if not could this actually effectively stall people coming back to work because they they say well actually you know the company can't provide the face masks um i i guess to some degree it depends whether they're saying it's face masks PPE face masks or face covering. So I, I guess we'll see that on Sunday. But 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 I, I would assume, Laura, that if the government's very clearly saying we need face masks and they're not available, that pe people aren't going to be able to come back in. Yeah, they're not going to come back safely. And there's there's your risk assessment, isn't it? You know, we can't face masks face masks aren't available, so therefore we can't get people back in back in safely. Mm. Um, but yeah, that will be led by by the guidance. And if the guidance is not saying that you should have face masks, there's obviously other things that you can try and do and that you say they are face coverings. And it will be similar to the, what we were doing pre-lockdown as well in terms of health and safety, you know, making sure that there's facilities for washing hands, um, so, you know, wipes, all these, these disinfectant things that we were doing pre-lockdown, pre they'll still be there and you'll still and employer will still have to provide these things, I think, going forward, uh, with or without really the government guidance. So there'll be certain things you have to do. And um, yeah, the, the availability of these these items will be will be a key concern and will have to uh, feed into your measures when when people are returning to work, unfortunately. Hmm. Caroline, as we uh, oh so got to Yeah. Sorry. I'll, I'll I'll come on with the with the one before, and then I'll 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 let you answer and read the next one. Um, as as we look at um, you know, I guess this this question of fairness, you know. So if you've, if you've got half a dozen employees and and you're asking some to come back and some to remain on furlough, um, you know, again, looking at that, how you know how because it could work both ways the people that are still on furlough could see that as unfair, but others have got back to full pay and the people that are on full pay could see it as unfair because they're now working in a in an environment where they're having to travel in the public and you know their colleagues are sat at home getting 80 percent of pay so you know I, I guess it's still around that sort of um communication issue but that that's a that's a that's a 
big deal. So, what, you know, what what other options could people be thinking about or companies be thinking about to try and sort of balance that up a little bit or find a way through that uh, that, that challenge? Yeah, well, I'm going to I'm going to be like the uh, broken record here because this is back to what I'm finding people are doing is they're asking their employees, they're saying. Um, this is the way we're thinking about coming back, whether it's split shifts, as, as Laura was saying, or uh, staggering, um, you know, times, start times, um, staggering who comes week one, who comes week two, week three, to enable that fairness. And I think it also depends on the numbers. Um, you know, how, how many employees are we talking about and, and how many? You probably won't be able to have even, and I think there was an IOD um, Institute of Directors thing I saw earlier and I think they're saying that you will not even have a quarter of your workforce won't be able to be in the workplace so if that's the case and uh, 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 you know you're going to have to find a fair way of um, of, of managing that it's going to be like a schedule and um, I think also the 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 following that I I know of people that have been furloughed um, who are very happy being furloughed because they're at home enjoying themselves, apparently. But I also know the employers in some cases have paid up their normal, um, the, the top, top the salary. So, so they're not, they're, they're still earning the same money. So there's not an unfairness about, oh, they're not got the same as me. So I think the way you bring them back has to be seen as fair as possible. So that everybody's got the same opportunity to come back and be at work as well as be at home. And, and the questioning back to let's find out what works for them. Um, let's take the ones who are dead keen to come back first, <laughs> if we can. I think that would make sense. I think we just have to be really full of common sense here because mm -hmm. we've never been in this situation before. Nobody has. Yeah. So that would be my thoughts around it. Mm, I think I would agree. Uh, we've had a question about temperature checking and and whether oh, we're yes. doing that as part of uh, you know the return to work for and the safe working practice for our our um, our workforce as they come in. Uh, you know, I, I guess Laura. You know, again, I'll pass to you. But I guess again, it's a it's a degree of common sense. If you if if your risk assessment says that actually you can't necessarily keep. Um, two meters apart let's say if it's a production line then maybe other measures like temperature checking may be uh, worth considering dependent on what the government says I guess it's uh, you know it, 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 it's really about every business going through their their their, um, their their risk assessment against the against the guidance and against the and against um, general good practice but Laura any thoughts on temperature checking yeah and it, it does seem like a good idea but again just to come down to availability as well. I mean, are you able to to, to do that? Um, it might be quite quite difficult, but I, I, certainly there's there, uh, there's nothing that would say don't. <laughs> um, but the guidance might say that you, you might have to in certain uh, workplace scenarios. I mean, if checking temperatures aren't uh, an option for you, you know, there might be other things that you can. You might have to ask employees to do before they come to work and after they come to work and it could be something like you know simply cleaning down their own workstation desk you know area workplace areas all these things that you know just get into a rhythm of doing every morning and every night before they leave and yes if you can do a temperature check maybe that's a, that's a good option and um, but yeah, i think i think availability will be an issue there really yeah. whether you can do it so if we were to sort of, you know, put a, a synopsis on on that, it's really about communication, get input, carry out the risk assessment, uh, and then really make sure that we understand what that is and all the employees understand what their actual responsibilities are mm -hmm. of their own safety as well, as, as we would with any health and safety issue, actually. There is a responsibility of the employee and, uh, and of the employee. Okay. So... I'd like to move on because, you know, I'm aware we've got the second question that was raised ahead of the the, 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 uh, the webinar. Um, you know, I think sadly we're all hearing daily now of, of companies that are making steps to uh, to sadly make redundancies, and I, I think um, uh, that uh, the government actually, or the Bank of England, have sort of this morning said that they expect uh, unemployment to rise to around about nine percent. 
Um, so, and that's happening even before the furlough scheme uh, starts to unwind. And, and there are a lot of sort of things to think about here. One is obviously the technical legal process that somebody should go through for, uh, you know, a redundancy in this uh, in this time. Um, but there are other things in there that I think you know we should consider. So there's things like reputational risk. You know, how will the public view or the your employees view if they've been furloughed? Uh, you know, uh, because you know that was the right thing to do and that was there to protect jobs. If then at the end of it they're not protected and they lose their job. Um, and of course we've got the um, the impact um, on on employees uh, of redundancy processes, both for those that remain, uh, but also those that are that are made redundant. So. Yeah, what what actions should the um, should the uh, the members and, and business people be taking uh, in in this regard? I, I'll go to you, Laura, first, and then uh, Caroline. Feel free to jump in. Yeah, it does seem like I'm getting a lot of questions right now about um, redundancy. It's not a redundancy, a restructure of, of businesses, which might then lead to some redundancy. So it's definitely at the forefront of everyone's mind. And obviously the reason for that is that for most businesses, payroll will be your biggest cost and you will be thinking about how to reduce those, those costs. Now, redundancies obviously are a, a long-term um, cost-saving measure rather than a short-term cost-saving measure. So if you are thinking about redundancies um, and you are planning a redundancy procedure, it should certainly be on the view that you do not feel like you can do some short-term measures first. It kind of is the last resort, I suppose, um, going to a redundancy procedure. And there is obviously a legal process behind that, trying to do it fairly. I mean, redundancy is a fair reason to dismiss employees, so you can obviously do it as long as you are trying out the procedure correctly. Um, whilst you are thinking about a redundancy procedure, and if you do feel like it is something that you, you will need to plan for and look at, it is worth looking at the short term measures first. And I'm, I can maybe go through them quite quickly about what they might look like. Um, the first thing is, I don't know if you've heard or seen just as options, it's a, lay, a temporary layoff or a temporary short time working scenario. Now, quite often these concepts or contractual concepts whereby there might be something in your employment contract that allows you to put employees on a layoff criteria or a short-term working criteria and it's worth looking at your contract of employment just to check whether you do have those clauses in there. If you don't have those clauses in there, again it's, it's worth considering even with a redundancy scenario in the background, um, can you ask that to cut hours cut pay, all those type of things. Now, obviously, there's a legal process behind that as well, a variation to their employment terms. But if it's a temporary measure that avoids redundancy, it might be something to consider. Particularly if what we were speaking about before, that you might not be able to get all staff in the office or in the factory or in the yard at the same time. Can you reduce hours? Can you reduce pay to you know, help cash flow? in these few months whilst we commit to lockdown. And mm -hmm. um, so those are certainly things I'm seeing people think about certainly. Now, if those sort of temporary measures won't work or you, you're not feeling like they couldn't work, then yes, redundancy might might be your option. Um, and I think for most people, um, a redundancy at that this time will be simply due to a reduction in work um, rather than a closure of business. I would hope it's not anything to do with closure of business, which is obviously a redundancy scenario. But I think in the main, we'll be talking about a diminishing need for work. Mm -hmm. um, and if that's the case, um, yeah, a redundancy process you know, should, be, should be started. And I think if you are going down that route, I mean, I'm, I'm always going to say you should take legal advice on that. There, there is a process follow, you need to make sure you're doing everything correctly and it's to, to help your employees and, and Mark said, 
the ones that are remaining as well, you want to be seen to be doing everything as fairly and efficiently as possible. So that will be key. Yeah. So I would just add, again, it was another client we were talking about this, and his business is really down. And um, he was saying how he um, he's done a cash flow with the financial director looking ahead. The business won't be, um, they're assuming, back up to the levels that they need it to be even in the next six months. And so, so they've done it to the end of this year, this calendar year. And he said, if we did um, salary cuts, and so they've got that plan for salary cuts from the director levels, they were going for 50%, 20% of the others, they planned out how they could actually survive. So I think going back to your point, Laura, is if you can survive and it's not uh, oh, we're closing the business scenario, then people actually, because they're again, back to this, they're all in it together. And if you can consult with them all, then they do want to, the business to survive. They don't want to be made redundant and have no other job to go to because it's a, it's not a good scenario at the moment. And, and you look around and you think, well, where am I going to get another job? So I think people will be willing to work differently and, and vary their hours, take a little less, might not like it, but I think they'd be willing to do it if we talk to them properly about it. I think the other thing that I always know with redundancy is those who are not made redundant and are left behind um, working, and you'd think they would feel good about this, they don't, they feel really guilty. Um, because, and, and that's a really hard one to then handle because the morale goes right under, under the carpet almost, you know, um, and that's quite hard to keep up. And, and at this moment, our motivation is, is um, tricky, you know, um, it, it's tricky on a personal basis, but it's tricky to be motivated when we're not in the workplace and we're not meeting our people and, and, and talking with each other and doing the normal stuff that we do, that we take for granted. But we're we're now not able to do so. I think that that morale issue is a real problem for the future. If we are too quick with our decisions to cut the costs uh, in a way that that are permanent, so I, I think I would agree with Laura on that one. Great, thank you guys. So I guess you know we're coming towards the end. So I'll, I'll try and pop in just a quick last question, and this is really around you know I mean I think we're all we're we're all now experts at working from home. Um, you know we. <laughs> Sort of, uh, you know, we, we all pivoted from going to the office and having lunch uh, at the local delicatessen to uh, to raiding the fridge uh, at eleven o'clock and then again at twelve o'clock. So it's 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 really sort of moved us into a different world. But we kind of did that on the fly as business leaders. I, I know we did. Uh, you know, even though we 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 as a practice quite a lot from home, there was much about what we did. We moved people to working from home overnight. Um, we change the way the technology worked to make that work. We got going and it's worked fine, but but we didn't do, um, it wasn't planned in the normal way you'd plan a move to uh, home working. There was no risk assessment of the way our teams were working from home. They just, I've gone and worked at home, whatever they're sat at. Um, you know, there was no real thought to the mental health of our teams. There was no thought to changing employment contracts to the fact they're now working from home, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I guess now, you know, it's pretty clear that whatever happens, we are in a world where this is the new norm. Um, you know, it may always be the new norm now. Um, you know, as people get to like it or companies realize that actually they can work this way. Mm. So we we are in a world where uh, you, we probably need to start to formalise the thing we did because we had to, um, you know, and, and 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 really start to get to uh, to working in a in a more appropriate sort of way. So I, I guess you know, again, I don't mind who goes first, actually, guys. But uh, you know, I, I, I'll, I'll start with you, Caroline. You know, as you look at as you look at this and and and. Uh, uh, and are thinking about this with your clients. What what should employers be doing to either catch up, or 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 more to capitalise on the productivity that that may be coming out of the lack of travel time, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera? It's, 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 it's amazing how this conversation is one I'm having quite currently. So I had a lady yesterday who has gained three hours a day from not travelling to work. And she said, I'm quite happy. But she said, I am missing the, the teamwork that you have by being in the workplace and also the, the creativity that you have by being with people. So I think there, and, and another huge global business that I've worked with, they are seeing the difference in their productivity. So people are working differently at home 
and, and they are getting more out of their work. So productivity is going up. And I find that fascinating. And that's something we've always, it's like the holy grail in, the, in, in discussions you have with businesses. Oh, productivity and, and you know, and you take CPI and they'll talk about productivity all the time in terms of the UK and how we're less than, you know, Germany and so it goes on. So actually, I think we need to, um, we need to look at, well, what are the, what are the highs and the lows of this working from home? Where are the gains mm -hmm. and where are the losses? And um, I don't know if it will become the new normal that everybody will work from home because I think being human beings, we really, we, we, we are human beings and we, we have the emotional factor and we will always want to connect with other people, but we might not connect with other people in the same way as we have done. And I think we'll be tempted to cut down on our travel, tempted to not use planes and um, cars as much because that's helping a longer term problem that we're going to have in the sustainability in the, of the, um, the um, you know, renewables, energy, all of that. And so I think there's lots of pluses and I think businesses would be I think they are looking at it and I think it would be wrong for them not to look at it. But they also need to look at what do what works best for their people because back to people like to be with others. And if we are going to be doing more working at home, then we need to make the systems that we've got work. So I know some organizations, they have just gone from being not really wanting to do remote working to we are now all doing remote working and we've got Microsoft Teams and we've got Zoom and the other internal communications, things like Slack. And I've only come across Slack a couple of times. I think this is a whole new system, but people are using that. So there are other ways to make it much more um, workable and 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 easier to um be on online and i think the other thing is about trust and how we empower our people so on online and remote working means we really have to trust people and at the moment we are i think just doing that without question but if we're going to carry on doing that then i think we need to be clearer as to well what is it we're asking people to do and how are we going to how are we going to check what they're doing not i don't mean um get like really on them I don't mean that but just making sure that we are outcomes focused and output focused and I think that might change the culture of organizations actually and and certainly will change how we lead mm. so I think there are some real challenges there and how do we keep having fun because fun is a huge part of what we get out of being at work mm. and online is not as much fun <laughs> so <laughs> any any, uh, any last comments on that question from yourself um, yeah, I think I think working from home. There's, there's been a there's been a few studies even before lock, lockdown and coronavirus about how useful a flexible working arrangement is. Um, and I think this lockdown has on, on proved some of those mm. studies, which is great. Have to work for your business though, and it has to work for your employees. So I know a lot of people will be thinking, oh, you know, it would be a nightmare. But others will hopefully be thinking there is a lot of positives here and from a legal point of view if it is something you are wanting to implement going forward and um, there, there will need to be some thought process behind it getting policies in place perhaps in terms of home working there's, there's obviously considerations in terms of communication data protection security all those things and you can get these policies put into place so that it, everybody is clear that yeah, you might be working from home, but you are still an employee of the business and you still have to adhere to all, all employment rules and procedures, et cetera. So um, there's definitely getting that those sort of things in place would be very, very ideal if you are thinking about a new flexible working structure for, for employees. So it's certainly something to think about. Great. Okay, so I'm very aware that we're, uh, we're, we're, we're bang on time, guys. So. Uh... Um, you know, I think uh, just like uh, previous uh, meeting with a different slant this time, but communication remains key. Talking to uh, talking to our employees and and actually understanding their concerns and their their thoughts and getting their input uh, with great ideas as to how we can actually all uh, get through this is a is a is a big deal. Um, getting those risk assessments down and those policies in place so that we're we're just making sure that everybody knows what they should be doing and we're getting uh, our businesses running in the in in the right sort of way um and and i think you know 
behind that taking the right legal advice when we need to take the right legal advice and and I, I guess the big one from from both of you guys was if we're thinking about redundancies because of the reputational and the human uh, impact if there's an alternative first take that step to look at the alternative first um, and uh, and uh, but obviously if, the, if there isn't an alternative then we need to uh, uh, you know, you need to uh, look after the majority, I guess, um, uh, from there. So, so I'm going to um, sort of try and bring the the webinar to an end. Thanks very much to everybody that's uh, that's joined the webinar. I hope uh, that again you found it in, informative and helpful as you're uh, thinking about bringing your businesses back up. Um, if you've any suggestions for future webinars, then uh, then let me know. Um, and uh, and we will try and build them in. I'd obviously like to thank our, our panelists today, Jeremy. Again, it's great to have you on the uh, the webinar, uh, and Caroline from Kinesis and uh, Laura from uh, McDonald Henderson. Um, if you've got specific questions or thoughts that you'd like uh, to connect with any of the individual uh, panelists, please feel free to do so. Their contact details will go out with the recording of this webinar. Um, it'll probably be, I guess, Monday now, actually, because we'll be, um, it will, we'll be off for the, uh, the weekend. Our next webinar will be in two weeks' time, uh, and we'll be looking at uh, actually rethinking real estate. Uh, mm -hmm. So we're going to come at it from a very different point of view to, uh, I, I guess, where the BCFA are with most of their webinars on this, where they're thinking about the use of the real estate. We're not going to be looking at it from that point of view. It is generally the, the second or third largest cost of any business. Uh, so we're going to be looking at it from the point of view of thinking about the sizing of that real estate and the op opportunities or uh, uh, thoughts around uh, both the size and also the rental cost. Um, so we'll have an expert from uh, the uh, real estate industry on the, uh, on the call and also an insolvency and a legal practitioner as well. So hopefully that will be an interesting topic yet to come. Um, but it will be in two weeks' time. Um, we have one of our experts is on holiday next week. How you have a holiday on lockdown, I'm not quite sure. It's still the same, but, uh, but he's on holiday next week. So our next webinar will be uh, in two weeks today. So once again, thanks very much for joining. I hope you all have a wonderful bank holiday weekend and enjoy the VE celebrations. Thank you very much, all. Thanks, Mark. Bye. Thank you.